how would you feel without a house to live in? Can you imagine yourself next to a giant intimidating mammoth which you would have to hunt down with the other members of your tribe? Can you put yourself in the shoes of someone who has never tasted a soup, a drink or a stew? Someone who has never experienced the aroma of freshly baked bread? Welcome to my third and last video about the Paleolithic period, which is going to be a little different from the previous ones. We have established that humanity arrived in, in the Japanese archipelago around 35,000 years ago, and that this colonization took place via three different routes, Taiwan Okinawa, Korea Kyushu, and Russia Hokkaido. This triple migration made the Paleolithic man genetically diverse and very different physically from the modern Japanese. The Paleolithic period extends until around 14,000 BC, 13,000 BC. During the transition period to the Jomon era, three important technologies were implemented. Microblades and microcores, tools called Mikoshiba Shoja Kubo, which already had ceramics in their manufacturing process, and finally the emergence of linear relief pottery. Before we move on to the Jomon period, however, I want to tell you about how early man lived his day-to-day -day life. And in order to make things more interesting, I'm going to ask you to collaborate in an imagination exercise. My scenarios will be very diverse, so you can imagine yourself exactly as you are, male or female, child or elderly. Life was taught in the Paleolithic era. When it comes to average life expectancy, you always have to bear in mind that it's, it is affected by infant mortality. But even if you take that out of the equation, the average man or woman wouldn't live as much as we do today. Disease will be the main cause for the shortness of human life, but we can ignore other causes, such as the harsh climate of the ice age, the risk of childbirth, or accidents during hunting, with the possibility of the hunter becoming the prey at any moment. Imagine the following scenario. You're lying in fetal position and although the sun isn't eating you directly in the eyes, your body can already feel the brightness that is slowly spreading across the world with the arrival of dawn. However, it's not a light that wakes you up, but a sudden drop in temperature, which causes an involuntary shiver. It's the coldest that they will get. You try to turn over and slip back into your previous stupor, but the rustling of the leaves only wakes you up even more. Resigned, you stand up and look around. What do you see? This is not an easy question to answer. As I've mentioned in previous videos, Japanese soil has a high volcanic ash content, which makes it very acidic, capable of disintegrating all organic material within it. This includes bones, animal skins and wood which means that almost everything we know today about Paleolithic Japan comes from looking at stone tools. As nomadic hunter-gatherers, the Paleolithic people didn't stay in one place for long. They hunted for food, particularly large prey. Their decisions regarding the movement of the tribe depended mainly on the migratory routes of the animals. It is therefore believed that most sites would be occupied for short periods, days, weeks, at most a few months. But what would these camps look like? Where did the Paleolithic man live? Although our first instinct is to think of caves, some scholars suggest that the Paleolithic people in Japan may also have used rudimentary portable houses made from animal skin. Structures of this type, being entirely organic, would have left no trace. As time progressed, the Paleolithic people abandoned these caves, or tents, to live in structures called pit dwellings. Pit dwellings were built by removing part of the ground to create a floor and then building pillars and a roof, made of straw, bark or mud. These houses, however, are characteristic of the Jomon period, so we won't devote to them more than this brief mention. The tribe you belong to is not yet so advanced. Whether they built tents out of animal skin or not, there were certainly times when Paleolithic people had to use natural shelters as a home. So, let's imagine that this is one of those occasions. You are temporarily living in a cave with the rest of the group, and so it's the walls of said cave that you see when you wake up. The place where you sleep is probably not located near the cave entrance, because if it was, you would be having to deal with weather phenomena such as wind and fog, which would make the nights unnecessarily unpleasant. 
it makes sense that you try to choose a sheltered spot, you and everyone else, so you all sleep relatively close together. If you turn your head to one side or the other, you will see your companions, who are also waking up. Somewhere nearby, one or more campfires are crackling merrily, and some members of the group have been up all night to keep an eye on them, given their importance. It cannot be ruled out that predators might be circulating in the area. Humans don't have night vision, so they need light to quickly detect and eliminate any threat. Campfires would be an ally, especially on the darkest nights. It's normal to look back and think of nighttime ambushes by wild animals with fear. You might even have thought, I don't know if I could even rest with that risk hanging over my head. But the truth is that attacks of this nature wouldn't be considered a common occurrence. It is estimated through the analysis of modern hunter gator communities and the application of mathematical models that the tribe would be divided into groups or bands of around 20-30 individuals. Thus, predators would be aware that it wouldn't be the best of ideas to try to attack one of these groups of humans. Even packs would ponder and decide to turn their fangs on easier prey, because even if they believed they could win the confrontation, there would certainly be casualties and injuries, and they would rather starve than lose elements. In short, only a particularly desperate and starving animal or group of animals would risk riding a night camp. In actuality, the nights would be safer than the days, when the group would have to split up into smaller parts so that each part could carry out its duties. You would be more at risk of being attacked by a Siberian lion if you were gathering acorns with one or two other companions than when you were sleeping surrounded by everyone and with someone watching over you. But where were we? Oh yes, the campfires. We have already seen that they were used for illumination and that they had the advantage of discouraging the advance of one or other daring animal. But we have yet to mention their most important role as a source of heat. Although no continental glaciers reached Japan, unlike in America and Europe, the temperature during the peak of the Ice Age was 7 to 8 degrees Celsius lower than it's today. Since the average global temperature in Japan is around 12 degrees Celsius, this would mean that at that time the temperature would have been around 4 or 5 degrees Celsius. In other words, this implies that the nights of the Japanese Paleolithic men were cold, but we know how resilient early man was. Let's not forget that some of these men even came from the Arctic Circle. Fire was, of course, the most vital of tools. Without it, humankind would never have left Africa, but we can't ignore the importance of the skins of hunted animals, without which people would have frozen. They would have used them to make warm clothing, footwear, woods with necessary, blankets, gloves, among other things. But now it's time to get up and start the day. The other men and women are also leaving their beds. Beds, you ask yourself. Did primitive human beings sleep in beds? In Japan, it's hard to say. Again, there are no traces to prove it. But in South Africa, evidence has been found that people used grass to build nests in which to sleep more than 2,100 years ago. These primitive beds were made up of bundles of grass from the Panicoidae subfamily, which have broad leaves, and were placed on layers of ash. The layers of ash had the function of keeping all kinds of crawling critters at bay. Ash and other inert pounders can be used as insecticides because they cause damage to the epicuticular lipid layer of various insect species. Ash could be obtained in two different ways. You could collect it directly from the remains of a campfire or you could burn a bed and use the resulting ash as a base for a new one. Burning the beds frequently was important. Archaeologist John Shea from Stony Brook University explains that Caves are disgusting places. We have to use them as shelter when we do field work in Eritrea and Israel. In these places there are bugs and things rot. Birds will also perch on the rocks, bringing lice with them. Any infestation would therefore mean having to burn down the entire dormitory, as we know how quickly pests spread. Not to do so would be to invite the disease to take hold. Of course, this is all 
purely speculative. Just because they did it in Sidubu doesn't mean that they would do it in Japan. Many tribes would simply abandon a cave when they perceived it to be inhabitable. And Africa's climate was completely different from Japan's, hotter and more prone to pestilence. Perhaps the people of Paleolithic Japan never came up with such advanced pest control techniques. As you have just woken up, you might be thirsty. Containers for storing water, such as ceramic pots, hadn't been invented yet, so you are forced to go to the nearest water source in order to quench your thirst. At least it isn't far away. And that's not by chance. As water is the second most essential commodity after oxygen and water sources are places that attract prey, it will be important to camp as close as possible to a river, lake, spring or underground aquifer. In a shelter so close to fresh water, mosquito infestations would in principle be a problem. But you are in a region with a cool climate and smoke keeps mosquitoes away, so that's one less thing to worry about. Those who stayed in Africa are less fortunate in that regard. Let's imagine that the water source near your campsite is a river, which flows at the base of a slope. What other characteristics does the place have apart from being close to that river? When choosing a place to camp, the tribe would prioritize sunny and high places. The first characteristic needs no explanation, but why high places? The answer has to do with hunting strategies. The camp ought to be situated on high ground so that the tribe could have a wide view of the region. This way, they would know when a large prey, for example a mammoth, was approaching. It would also be possible to guide animals to fall off a cliff or into a ravine, which would result in injury and even death. The humans would then scavenge the meat. You have now reached the river and quenched your thirst. And now comes the inevitable question. Did I shower? Did I wash my face? My beard or my hair? You should be used by now to how these things work. We don't know. In the absence of structures like bathtubs or products like essences and soups, how is modern man supposed to find out whether or not his primitive ancestor bathed? Although there is a widespread belief that the Stone Age man was a pig and never watched, this hypothesis is just as likely as its opposite. So let's simply try to use common sense. Perhaps humankind didn't bet as often as we do today, let alone in a cold place like Japan at the time. Possibly the concept of hygiene wouldn't exist and there wouldn't be any kind of daily, weekly or monthly routine. But at the same time it's hard to believe that they wouldn't do anything if, for example, they had something that was irritating their skin. Wouldn't they try to get rid of said thing at all costs? Wouldn't that include trying to wash the affected area? And if sweat mixed with dust, mud and leaves makes you frown, I'm sorry to say that this kind of dirt would be the last of your worries. Killing an animal, gutting it, cooking it, all these would involve contact with fluids. Blood, yes, but also gastric juices, for example. There are also insects that seek to lay eggs on the warm skin of animals, even when those animals are alive. Let's imagine another scenario. A piece of beard or hair that has gotten so dirty, something helped by the presence of sticky substances such as sap, that it has become a nuisance. It could happen that man or woman to whom this happened would decide to cut off that piece of hair. It would certainly be easier than trying to save the situation with water, and in a Paleolithic camp there would be no shortage of sharp instruments. Unraveling this mystery isn't easy. But as a last thought exercise, we are going to observe the behavior of our fellow primates, namely a phenomenon called... I'm sorry that I can say this word. I'm afraid YouTube is going to think I'm referring to the other kind of... So yeah, that's why I'm not saying the word. So, during... One animal cleans the fur of another member of the group which includes removing lice, fleas and ticks. This process also has the purpose of fostering social relationships between individuals of the same group, so it's not unreasonable to imagine that within Paleolithic populations people will also each other. And since we are in Japan, I'm obliged to talk about hot springs. 
Hot springs are natural phenomena where geothermically heated water emerges from the Earth's interior and forms places where you can bet. Water is defined as a hot spring if it's above 25 degrees Celsius or contains specific components. Even monkeys have learned to appreciate these waters, as can be seen in Zhou Xin Etsu Kogen National Park. The relationship between hot springs and the Japanese is old and deep. Traces found in archaeological sites from the Jomon era indicate that they were already part of the lives of the people of that period. But we are not in the Jomon era yet, so I'm going to ask you to refrain from imagining your Paleolithic self lounging in a hot spring given the lack of evidence. I know that in the previous minutes I've only talked about filth and that this is, on the other hand, a consoling scenario, but anyway. You are now on your way back to camp. During the walk, you took the opportunity to relieve yourself in a bush. By now everyone has woken up. You have to look for food, but that's exhausting, so this would be the best time to have a meal. What does this meal consist of? In other words, what did the Paleolithic man eat? The staple foods of the diet of the people of that era resulted from three activities, hunting, fishing and gathering. Hunting was predominant in the winter, fishing in the summer, and food gathering in spring and fall. As meat, fish and plants are very general terms, I will try to be a little bit more specific. At that time, Arctic tundra covered much of Hokkaido. The taiga is not particularly prosperous. In many areas, the soil is shallow and not very nutritious, and most of the water exists in the form of ice, so it can't be absorbed by plant roots. During the winter, there are also heavy snowfalls and strong winds. Conifers, pines, evergreens, and others reign supreme in this region. Their conical shape allows them to easily free themselves from the snow, and their thorny leaves are protected by wax. The conifers produce pine cones, loaded with nutritious seeds. Northern Honshu and central Japan, meanwhile, were covered in boreal forests, where you could find larch, spruce and Japanese hemlock. Various bushes grow in the south region of Taiga and in the boreal forests, bushes that carry a wide variety of berries. Finally, western Japan, from the Kanto region to the southern Kyushu, was covered in temperate coniferous forests, where food was easier to find. In the Tochigi region, for example, it is believed that the Paleolithic peoples harvested Japanese angelica buds, aralia plants, flowering ferns, osta, mountain burdock, lily bulbs, yams, wild grapes, walnuts, among other edible plants. The ruins of the oldest known Japanese settlement on the island of Tanegashima, off southern Kyushu, show that early men began gathering nuts very early, more than 30,900 years ago. In these ruins, 50 stone tools believed to have been used to crush nuts were also found, as well as two collections of stones believed to have been used as stoves, six holes filled with ashes that may have been ovens, and other holes believed to have been used for storage. As for the animals, now men elephants, yabs elk, other elk, brown bears, steppe bison, and aurochs, were among the many large animals that lived in the forests of eastern and northern Japan, along with what we know today as Arctic fauna. At the Atsunegaara archaeological site in Shizuoka, 56 prehistoric pit traps have been found that show us how people captured large animals, such as wild boar or even larger, 27,000 or 25,000 years ago. In Lake Noji, bone artifacts were found, splinters and a cleaver. These remains suggest that Lake Nojiri was a place where Nauman elephants and Yab elk were slaughtered and butchered, but experts aren't sure whether people hunted and killed these animals or just practiced scavenging. In short, hunting in the Paleolithic era would not have been as simple as it might at first appear and there is evidence that men used all kinds of techniques and tricks to get the better of prey that, ultimately, was either stronger, faster or both. These techniques could therefore include setting traps, directing the movement of an animal in order to kill it, and chasing an animal under certain conditions in order to exhaust it, which could take days. 
As far as fishing is concerned, I thought I haven't found any information about fishing in Japan specifically. It should be noted that at the time, the use of barbed spears or harpoons was widespread in various parts of the world. The capture of aquatic fauna was not limited to fish, but also included shellfish and crustaceans. Since the act of molding ceramics had not yet been mastered, it's obvious that the Paleolithic people did not eat of ceramic plates. Most likely they used their fingers, leaves, forks and bone plates and stone dishes. Meat wasn't eaten raw, it was smoked, grilled or dehydrated. You can thank Izanami for that, she who sacrificed her life to bring fire to the world. The menu for the day is grilled air accompanied by walnuts and raspberries. You finish eating and wipe the grease off your hands with some leaves. This is the moment when the scenarios can branch out. For a large part of the day, you will be concentrating on the task of obtaining food. And there are, as we have already seen, three ways of accomplishing this task. By hunting, by fishing or by foraging. And since all three are important, I will let you choose which one you dedicate your day to. Perhaps you can even create a scenario in which you can combine more than one of them. But can I do any of the jobs? Was there a gender division? Were some people more important than others and therefore excluded for, from certain tasks? You might ask yourself. The division of labor in the Paleolithic era has been a widely discussed topic in recent years, and the answer to it might not be straightforward. Theories range from complex segregation by sex and the existence of a primitive hierarchy to pure egalitarianism. I'm not going to go into depth on this subject because it's like a ball of yarn. If I grab one end and start unraveling it, I will never find the end. The study of this subject involves the analysis of bone trauma in fossils, the analysis of objects buried with the dead, and the study of the countless hunter-gatherer tribes of today, with the proviso that they live in different conditions from the tribes of yesteryear. In certain tribes, it is possible that any existing divisions would not be particularly rigid, given the small size of the groups. The number of people that would need to be allocated to each task would vary according to the season and other factors. This is not to say that an individual would not be in charge of specific main tasks in which they would be involved most of the time, but rather that a certain flexibility might have been necessary, especially in places where resources were not abundant or during periods of scarcity. In the specific case, anyone would be learning survival skills from the moment they were able to stand on their legs and lift the spear off the ground. You would know how to hunt, fish, distinguish an edible berry from a poisonous one, cut stone and make loads. But to work you need tools, so let's take a closer look at the objects that gave this era its name. When it comes to stone tools, there are two main categories core tools and flake tools. Core tools are large and rod and come about when a fist-sized rock, called a core, is worked by a similar rock called a hammer rock. The hammer rock fragments the surface of the core rock. This process results not only in a worked core tool, but also in several large ships, which can then also be turned into tools, which are called flake tools. Throughout the Paleolithic period in Japan, the techniques used to make stone tools began to differ and show regional differences. As for the purpose of each of these tools, there are still many doubts. Some were used for skinning, others for butchering or digging, and still others were tied to the end of a wooden shaft and used as spearheads. Researchers are currently working to classify, categorize and name a panoply of tools according to their shape, size, the period in which they were found, and the area from which they were unearthed. Some notable tools are, for example, trapezoids, edge ground stone axes, black blades, leaf shaped bifacial point tools, pebble tools, grinding and pounding tools, and microblades. Of these, one deserves a special mention Saise Kijin. Saise Kijin is a tool from the microlith Seiseki category. It has a sharp edge and is less than a centimeter wide. 
Senseki gin were produced in large numbers and incorporated into spears and harpoons to increase their effectiveness and piercing capacity. The remains of a workplace where these microblades were produced from obsidian have been found. There is evidence that Japanese Paleolithic men intentionally incorporated obsidian into the creation of tools from a very early age, as it was being sourced on the island of Kojushima, south of Tokyo, and carried on boats to Honshu. Archaeologists also found evidence that 35,000 years ago, humans climbed a mountain in what is now Tochigi Prefecture to obtain this igneous rock. Finally, it is important to mention that the ground stone sets and polished stone sets have been found in Japan earlier than almost anywhere else in the world, with the exception of Australia, where even older ground stones have been found. These tools are a technology associated with the early Neolithic period, so it's not known why they appeared so early in Japan. With all this information, you can build your Paleolithic toolkit and choose the tools that best suit the task ahead of you. Discoveries made in southwestern Hokkaido have led scientists to conclude that the people of that period buried their dead and decorated their, their bodies, which not only demonstrates an understanding of the concepts of life and, of life and death, but also proves that the social relationships between members of a tribe run deep. So as you pass the burial place of a loved one on your way back to camp after an exhausting day, you reflect on how much you miss them. Sunset finds you gathered around the campfire, socializing, laughing, and talking about today's events, while your hands are busy sharpening weapons and making clothes. To make clothes from animal skins, basic tools needed are called scrappers. A skin can be separated from a carcass using various tools, but cleaning the inside surface of the skin is preferably done with scrapper tools. Shells were used by hunter-gatherers when available, but the most common scrapper tools found by archaeologists are made of stone. To make complex clothing, Paleolithic men had to use two additional tools in addition to scrappers. Firstly, the skins had to be cut into certain shapes, such as rectangles and triangles. Secondly, the cut pieces had to be joined together. These two additional steps would have been necessary when making, for example, shirts with sleeves or pants. The long, sharp-edged stone tools used to cut the skins were called blades, while the piercing tools used to join the clothes were called awls. The awls were mostly made of bone, and if they were particularly thin, they would be called needles. Given the cold climate of Paleolithic Japan and the origins of the people who inhabited it, it's safe to say that complex clothing was being made in this case. Very few examples of art from before the Jomon era have been found in Japan. A popular theory expresses that perhaps the people of the time had a preference for using organic material in their artistic endeavors. If a common habit was to paint on animal skins, for example, this would leave no traces to be discovered. The oldest recorded art form in Japan is a round shell pebble 5 cm long, 3 cm wide and 3 cm height on which a groove and 17 fine lines have been engraved in a representation of the female form. This pebble was found in Mimitori, Kagoshima Prefecture, and had been dated to be 24,000 years old. The second oldest form of Paleolithic art, 12,165 years old, was also a pebble, again depicting a woman, this time found in the Kamikuroya Cave, Ehime Prefecture. There is a myth that in a society without electronics, people would go to bed as soon as the sun went down. The researchers from Hunter College, Yale University, UC Santa Barbara and the University of New Mexico recorded the sleep patterns of the Adza, hunter-gatherers who live near the Serengeti National Park, and made some fascinating discoveries. The study participants stayed awake for an average of 3 hours and 20 minutes after sunset. The number of hours slept varied according to the seasons, on average 6 hours in the summer and just under 7 in the winter. Naps were not frequent. The group of people studied lived close to the equator, so one has to be careful with extrapolations. But one thing is certain, humans sleep much less than other primates. 
David Sampson, assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Toronto, explains that according to his models, humans should sleep 10 and a half to 11 hours. And the reason they don't need to is because 25% of their sleep is REM, rapid eye movement sleep. No other primate is capable of spending so much time in REM. Too much deep sleep is dangerous. The REM phase is the phase of sleep in which we have dreams which is why our muscles are paralyzed. Samson's theory, the social sleep hypothesis, suggests that human sleep evolved in this way because humans began sleeping in groups, where certain members would keep an eye on the others. More REM sleep means shorter sleep duration, and so prehistoric humans had a few extra hours that they could devote to socializing and developing skills, which might have played a crucial role in their evolution. But now the night is drawing in, and it's time to close this chapter. You can decide to retire or offer to take the first watch. Tomorrow won't be much different from the day you have just experienced it, but tomorrow, in the more abstract sense, will take us to the Jomon period. Between 20,000 and 15,000 years ago, rising sea levels severed the connection between Japan and the Asian continent. As the Ice Age draws to a close, temperatures are rising and this global climate change revolutionizes lifestyles and cultures. In the Japanese archipelago, mammoths and other large animals are facing extinction, and coniferous forests are beginning to be replaced by more temperate ones. The rising sea creates better environments for fish and selfish, and the warmer climate makes the forests richer, particularly in acorns, cessnuts and walnuts. And so the German culture was born. I hope you enjoyed my third and final video on Paleolithic Japan. I think I have given you plenty of content for you to create your own scenarios. So feel free to share them in the comments. What tasks did you accomplish? What setbacks did you face? What's your favorite food? How is your relationship with other members of the group? And so on. Because the Paleolithic period is so speculative, there are there's a certain tendency to gloss over it, but I think it's important to theorize and to reflect on the subject. This is just my opinion, of course, you can disagree, but I didn't want to simply present the certainties and move on. I wanted to try to go a little deeper than that. Anyway, I hope you have enjoyed it and see you next week.